Hey guys, Jim here. Time for a little, a little ramble video. I haven't had a chance to do one of these in a while. I've been uh, very uh, fastidiously working on guest blade videos and my new acquisition videos. And what I wanted to kind of tackle tonight as the subject is secondary market values and how insane they've gone. For those of you that watched the video that I made in Stan Wilson's shop, uh, you, you know where I'm going to be going with this. If you have not seen that video, stop this video here and go watch that video. I think I entitled it, uh, I Visit Stan Wilson's Shop, I think is what it was called. Please do go watch that video and then come back to this and you'll get a better understanding of what I'm talking about. When we talk about secondary market values, we're talking about knives that are either so rare and so unattainable, the only way we're going to get it is from another collector or from a dealer that likes to mark things up like crazy. Or we're just talking about knives that we don't want to wait to get. Maybe we could order it from the maker, but we're going to pay a premium to get it in our hands more quickly from somebody else that has one available. What we're looking at right here is, if you looked at the secondary market value, just kind of added all this up, you'd be right around $27,000 for what I have sitting just in this small frame. For what, 3, 6, 10, 11 knives? $27,000 approximately in the current values on the secondary market. $6,000 of that being right here in this one. This is a Todd Rexford Hot Hammered Epicenter XL. This is, oh, it's so sexy. You'll be seeing a video on this one soon. I want to be very clear in saying that the knives that I have here are all very, very high quality. I'm not knocking the quality of the knives in any way or saying that they're not worth a good amount of money. And I'm not knocking the makers because the makers have absolutely nothing to do with how the prices go on the secondary market. You take this Rexford for example. This is an amazing, truly amazing knife in every way. And my camera really wants to focus on the knives in the background, so I apologize. There are very few knives that are this exciting in the knife world. But is it worth $6,000? Is it $6,000 exciting? Nope. These are selling for five times what Todd makes them for. You know the people that bust their asses to get this knife the most from Todd, whether it be in a lottery, in an auction, or something like that? You know the guys that are really busting their asses to get these knives? They're not even going to have this knife for a day. They're not buying this knife because they love this knife. They're buying this knife because they know people are paying a premium, and they're going to flip it and make a profit. Now, I'm not here to tell people what to do. I'm not going to say you're, a, you're an evil son of a bitch for taking advantage of the market. The market is what the market is. Unfortunately, it's us, the buyers, that have created that market. Here's another crazy expensive one. This super smooth mayo. Well, you're certainly not going to get it from Tom. So you're going to pay a super premium to get your hands on one. I guess the point of the video really is this. When you take a knife like, for example, again, with Stan Wilson, with his, uh, with his advisor, I just placed my order for mine. We're looking at between four and $5,000 for that one single knife. But that's a knife that every single solitary part of that knife is completely finished. The entire knife is built of Damascus. The blade, 
both sides of the handle. The interior is all going to be titanium. Every screw is individually cut down and shaped and everything by Stan. Every screw in that knife. There are no visible screws on the outside. He has to assemble it by using a tool that slips in here to screw the knife together. There are no visible screws holding his inlays in. That's all done through a special process that he created with these uh, little keyholes. He has bits of solid gold inside of the knife. He completely hides the, the spring for his double action so you can't see it when you look inside the knife. It looks like the backspacer. The release button is com almost completely invisible, yet it's there. That's a knife that has so many hours in it that he doesn't even bother to count anymore. That's a knife that's four or five thousand dollars. This birch in my hands is an absolutely stunning knife. You know what this knife sells for from Michael Birch directly? Right around in the range of a thousand bucks. Maybe with the, this particular bolster material, it's a little bit more. Let's give it, let's just call it 1500 just to be completely safe. It flips like a demon. The, the blade weighs almost as much as a damn hammer, yet it comes flying out. It's insanely smooth. It's got a beautiful hamon all the way through the blade. This is a world-class, amazing knife. On the secondary market, you're going to pay in the range of $4,000 for this thousand to fifteen hundred dollar knife. It's harder and harder and harder to justify these days. Even stuff like this, a Medford Praetorian, it's not due to the rarity or exclusivity because he's happy to take your order right now. It's because people don't want to wait. It's a six to nine month wait to get a Praetorian tie. It's already expensive from Medford. 1200 bucks. Mine was 13 because it's one of the 10 that he made in S35VN. This, by the way, was the one that gave me that by pinching my finger right in there because I was on the telephone not paying attention when I was breaking the knife in. You'll see guys easily get an extra four to $500 out of their Praetorian ties. Shirogorovs, oh my goodness, don't even get me started. People that have bought these are selling them for insane amounts of money. This is, I, oh, I want to say this was, a, these were six or 650 from what I recall. You're easily going to pay twelve to $1,500 these days for this exact Model 95 tie. So I went on eBay yesterday for like 1500 I think that's... That's excessive. Or, I'm sorry, 1700 That's excessive. That's just ridiculousness. But here's the thing, though. As people continue to pay for it and jump on it and go, oh, my God, hell yeah, I'll do it. People know they're going to get the money out of it. And they're going to keep doing it. So the only people that can stop the insanity, we're the only ones. And I've done my little part on that. Sure, I've overpaid on a few things. I've never paid, I don't believe, I don't believe I've ever paid more than double the maker's price for any knife. Because I just simply draw the line there. I refuse to do it. It's Jeremy Marsh is worth a fortune. Wouldn't pay what the secondary market is on it, no matter how awesome the Vanquish really is. And it is. It's a freaking, <laughs> it's a monster, killer cool knife. But I wouldn't pay three thousand dollars for this knife like many people would a friend of mine just bought a, a mayo dr death jr flipper the knife i'm searching for right now eight nine hundred dollar knife i said you know i'll go up to you know sixteen seventeen hundred dollars for it just because you're just you know you're not going to get one my good friend and i won't say his name because i don't want to embarrass him and he, i know he watches my videos from time to time he paid Far in excess of $3,000 for that Dr. Death Flipper. Listen, that knife is not worth that kind of money. And here's what I told him, and here's the real point of all of this. 
I said, you better decide very quickly when you get it if you love it or not. He says, why? I said, because you need, if you don't love it, you need to flip it as quickly as you can while that particular maker is really, really hot right now. Because I guarantee you in a year, you're going to probably lose $1,500 to $2,000 trying to sell that knife. You will not, it will not stay that expensive. The value will not remain that high. We all know what happens with Southerns. Southerns, the value just goes up and up and up and up and up. Well, a friend of mine just got offered a tad flipping, uh, what is it, it is the Southern flipping Dauntless. Thank you. One of the tad knives that he did. And he says, yeah, this guy's offering me this, uh, this, this awesome knife and he puts X amount of dollars in value on it. He says, what do you think? I said, well, you know, I'm not an expert on that. Let me, let me call up one who is. I know, I sound like that bald guy from the pawn show. I'm not an expert on this, but I've got a friend that is. I don't think he talks like Jimmy Stewart either. What the hell was that? Jesus, dude. So I contacted Justin Laffer, of course. If you're gonna if you're gonna ask anybody about values of secondary market Southerns, Justin's the guy to go to. And he says, you know what? He goes, three months ago, six months ago, those things were going for over five thousand dollars. He goes, right now it's worth probably around three to thirty five hundred. For whatever reason, the bottom fell out on that one particular knife. And I'm hearing from a few other people that may be tads in general. I don't know. I don't have any, you know, expertise in that, so I can't tell you that for sure. So can you imagine the guys that paid over $5,000 for that knife to be the cool kid that had one? And now their knife has already lost probably $2,000 and may continue to lose more. Of course, we never buy knives as an investment. We shouldn't anyway, but I do believe some people out there still do. Here's a great example. The Shurigorov Model 111. It's a badass knife. I was very happy when I got it, but the problem was I didn't realize how, how insanely huge the knife really is. This is a big ass knife. It's bigger than what I typically enjoy carrying. So I figured, well, I'll sell it. I'll put a nice price on it. Not, nothing crazy ridiculous. It was nearly impossible. And I even put it up on eBay at $700. Couldn't get it. I did just recently sell it to a friend today, as a matter of fact. But even the, the knives that you think are a sure thing, at some point, won't be. This is still a badass knife, and he's still got a hell of a great deal. And he would be able to get out of it what he paid for it. But it's not going up crazy, crazy, crazy. It's going to happen to everybody. As long as this keeps happening, I would love to be able to buy this knife right here. That Rexford, you guys know that... One of my ultimate grails is a Rexford Epicenter, a real true Rexford Epicenter. Hot hammered or not, doesn't matter to me. And I'm, I'm happy to pay the $1,000 that it cost. I'm happy to pay a, a considerable amount more for the convenience of being able to buy one because you cannot order one. There should always be a premium for things like that. I'm not arguing the fact that something that's exclusive or rare, I'm not arguing the fact that it sh you should or should not go up in value. Of course it should. You know, to say otherwise would be stupid. But should an eight or nine hundred dollar knife sell for six thousand dollars? And I don't know that this one would have been eight or nine hundred. I just mean a general, normal, average epicenter, not an XL, not hot hammered. But you get what I'm saying. We've seen those sell between five and six thousand dollars, guys. Should it sell for that? No, it, it honestly should not. But because there's somebody out there that is willing to put that kind of money out, everybody that gets their hands on one knows what they can get now. That market has been set. But every now and then, one gets knocked down a peg or two. Some of you might remember the big rush that was going on six months or more ago 
on the Kershaw tilt, a production knife of all things. But it was one of those production knives that, man, Kershaw just got right, didn't they? It was just a, that thing was darn near custom in the way that it felt and the way that it, it operated. It was just amazing. It was a $400 knife when it came out, and people were getting $850, $900, $1,000, $1,300 for them. And then I flip over to Arizona Custom Knives about two weeks ago, and what do I see? I see that they have bought one from somebody, which means they had to pay money for it, and then they had to mark it up to be able to make a profit. They had it for $275. Now, it was used, and it had a couple of slight marks. I think it was on the clip. I don't recall. But still, it wasn't 1000 It wasn't 800 It wasn't 500 It wasn't even the 400 they originally sold for. And I saw guys selling used ones in the seven to eight hundred dollar range. It went for two seventy five. Hopefully that will then influence the values of that knife going forward. I apologize to anybody that bought a few of those as an investment. I'm not saying screw you. I'm just saying I hope that it starts getting a little bit more realistic. So if you've got one, eh, might might now might be the good time to get out from under it. Who knows? It could have just been a fluke. You never know. But like I said, every knife sitting here is an incredible knife in its own right. Just not worth what the secondary market is demanding. And there may not be an answer. There may not be a way that we can truly do anything about it. I just hope that we can because it will allow more of us to enjoy more great knives. Instead of just the handful of people, they can just, it almost seems like their pockets are limitless. And I do realize that I buy a lot of very expensive knives and I try to get very unique things. But I, the, the most I think I ever overpaid was on my first RJ Martin Q36. I paid $1,400 for a knife that uh, sells from RJ for $850. That's the most I've gone over in value, I do believe. But I had a limit. I knew I was not going to exceed $1,500 for one. And now I see them every day going $1,600, $1,700, $1,800. Same configuration. You have to put a limit on what you're willing to do. And I understand that if you do that, you're thinking to yourself, okay, I'll do that, Jim. I'm going to do that. I'm going to say that the next time I see a Shurigorov Model 95T, that my limit is going to be $900, period. And then you're going to walk away from one. Then five minutes later, somebody else is going to buy it at $1,300. I get that. I get how difficult it is to do that. But if everybody were able to do that, even, yes, the guys that, you know, the, the, the type that you walk up to and shake them really hard and $100 bills fall out of their anus, even those guys, if they could feel a way to pull back every now and then and just go, it's not worth it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't buy what you want. No, 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 no. Just put it in perspective. If, let's say, this mayo went up for $4,000. I'm not saying that it would, but let's say it did. Would you want this at $4,000, or would you rather have, I don't know, a Michael Walker? Or, again, Stan Wilson? Or have a couple of Todd Fishers? There is a difference in the amount of work and the quality of work that goes into this and that level. That doesn't take away from how great this mayo is, but it's a different level. Corvette's a great car, but if a Corvette, and I don't mean a ZR1, a Corvette sold for the same price as, I don't know, a McLaren, I think I'd rather have the McLaren, wouldn't you? So it's all relative. The longer we continue to overpay, grossly overpay, again, I understand overpaying a little bit to a certain degree, and that's always going to happen on limited status items. But the longer we continue to grossly overpay, the longer this is going to go on, and the worse it's going to get. 
we're seeing right now, I saw a dealer selling some Dwayne Carrillo knives. Dwayne is currently taking orders, guys, with no more than a six-month wait. You could buy a $1,200 knife, and the dealer has them for over $3,000. This is what I'm talking about. And this is not a dealer thing. I'm not bashing dealers. It could be that guy selling on the knife forum that you, that you uh, frequent. It could be just a shark that does nothing but buy knives to mark them up and resell them. That goes to shows only to get into the lotteries. Even something as small as a hinderer lottery. To buy a knife for $495 and sell it for $900 two days later. It's people that don't have a passion for what we love. Doing nothing but churning a profit off of our passion. If there's a way to squelch it, I'd love to figure it out. I don't think there's a cut and dry answer. But I think at some point we do need to start speaking with our wallets or it's just going to get worse. All right. I have rambled on long enough, over 21 minutes. Thank you guys, as always, for tuning in. And I hope this was worthwhile for you. And I hope some really good conversations come out of this. Don't get catty. Don't start fighting. Don't say, don't call one guy a moron because he spent too much. Or you call some other guy a moron because he can't afford to spend that much. And he doesn't understand the value. Values are different in each level of knife making. This is a badass knife. It just ain't five, six thousand dollars badass. That is the artificial value that has been placed upon it by those that have had them and sold them at higher and higher prices to see how much they could get out of them. That's the difference I'm talking about. All right, guys, I'm going to get out of here for now. Good seeing you as always. Thank you for joining me, and I will see you again in, a, in an episode very soon where I get to play with this insane birch tangent, which really is a drool-worthy knife. See you guys soon.